Good morning, and welcome to today's episode of This Is Automation Live. I am your host, Corey Dallas. Um, excited today to talk to you about Track software. Uh, so this is a uh, really uh, fun topic. We talk a lot about Track from the mechanical side and how it works at the system level. Um, but we wanted to jump into the automation studio side of it. So we're going to be carrying on the conversation uh, that Jeremy and I had as far as how you leverage automation studio to build out your machine. So if you haven't seen that live stream, make sure you go check it out. And uh, coming up next, um, tomorrow actually, so we've got a, a double header of sorts. Um, we have the database for industrial machines episode. So we see a lot of um, machine builders out there uh, trying to leverage data in new ways. So this is gonna be an episode that shows you how to uh, write data to a database from your PLC, from your controller, and then also how to execute queries and to get that data uh, back into the PLC. So um, that, that can really enable some neat and scalable solutions uh, for how to handle big amounts of data in, indu in industrial machines. So that's gonna be a fun one. And then after that, we got a special request to kind of talk through how do you organize uh, inside of Automation Studio? What are the best practices for naming conventions and where you put certain things in the packages and um, data types and variables? So we're gonna go through all of those different best practices with how to organize your Automation Studio project to make sure that it's you know as modular and scalable as possible and also that you're using all of the best practices. So if you're an Automation Studio user, uh, that, that's definitely gonna be one that you wanna tune into. So that's gonna be uh, happening next week. So uh, back to the good stuff. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Track software. And to do that, we have a special guest um, as always. Um, today we have Garrett Christians. So thanks for joining Garrett. Hi Corey, thanks for having me. Uh, Garrett is a technology engineer uh, for the Southeast team. So he works on the Western side of our region, um, but he's still a part of the Southeast. And um, he works a lot with these Track systems. So he is definitely a guru of sorts of Track software. So he's going to help us walk through Automation Studio and tell us how to program a track. So thanks again for joining. Yeah, absolutely. Really excited to talk about this. Awesome. So in keeping with tradition, we'll, we'll give a high level introduction to the Track and then jump into Automation Studio. Um, again, we're not going to talk too much about the use cases or the hardware. Um, that's something that, that you know we as a community talk about a lot. So there's a good podcast episode um, on This Is Automation, uh, two good ones actually about Track. So you could check that out as well as a bunch of YouTube videos out there. So uh, feel free to just search Track if you wanted to just see one running. Um, but to get us started, um, we'll take a look at an Track. So this is what the Track looks like. Um, and uh, basically the different components uh, that, that we have are the shuttles and the track. And so we would call this a long stator linear motor. And basically what that means is we have, uh, you know, copper windings inside of the segments and the shuttles have permanent magnets inside of them. We can control the current that's flowing through those segments uh, to generate force on the shuttle. Um, that's the basic principle. We do lots of uh, really fancy control stuff in the background uh, to make sure that we can control the velocity, the acceleration, the position, um, et cetera, of each shuttle independently. So um, it's it's somewhat different from you know traditional conveyance where everything's kind of moving at a constant velocity. Here we can really dynamically adjust how the shuttles are moving without any you know uh, external components, you know pins or something po popping up to stop the shuttle. You don't need any of that. It's it's all done with electromagnetics. So it's really powerful uh, system uh, with really tight control and it's very fast. The other part of the ACPOS track that's I think important to mention is uh, these sections here. So you see there's two adjacent tracks and what we can do at these sections is actually divert a shuttle to go either one way on the track or the other way. Um, that's very, very powerful in some applications. And then, uh, so let's say for example, we, we were coming around this larger loop, we divert off to the smaller loop then we convert back in. We can do all of this at full speed with no mechanical components. So that's just electromagnetics. We weaken the, the field on one side and the shuttle will actually jump over to the other track. Um, so very high speed, very low wear, very powerful. So in, in more detail, the different components of a track system, again, we talk about these a lot. So probably just a refresher for, for most of the people watching. 
um, we have the motor segments. So when I was talking about coil windings a minute ago, the segments, which is this kind of lighter silver part, um, that's where those windings live. Um, a track is usually made up of multiple segments. So if this 180 degree turn, for example, has uh, you know this curved segment here, three circular segments and another curved segment um, on the exit side. The, the segments sit inside what we call a guide. So it's, it's a little easier to see on this bottom picture here, um, kind of the, the darker metal part is called a guide. So the wheels of the shuttle ride along that guide. That's a precision ground component. Um, and the segments kind of sit inside the guide. So the, the guides are, are kind of the precision piece that uh, you align and make sure everything's all in the right place. And then those segments just kind of slide in uh, to, to provide the power for the shuttles. And lastly, certainly not least, is the shuttle. So the shuttles are pretty simple. They just have permanent magnets inside of them, either on one side or both, depending on whether or not you have diverts in the system, and four wheels. Uh, so really minimal amount of mechanical parts, um, very minimal amount of moving parts. Uh, those shuttles are held onto the track with the permanent magnetic force and are very easily you know, to swap out um, and such. So. That's stuff that we talk about all the time, but there's a piece that we don't really get a chance to talk about a whole lot. So that's what we're gonna do today, and that's software. So software is kind of the missing piece of the ACPOS track puzzle. And when we look at the track, it's basically, um, we'll get into this in, in just a little bit, but it's, it's built up of what we call process points. Um, so just keep that, that word in your mind for right now, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, but what Garrett's gonna walk us through real quick is um, an automation studio guide basically. So you can uh, find this in the help file yourself and walk through it. I wouldn't recommend doing it uh, live with us uh, just in case um, you, you get caught on a step, but that's exactly what we're gonna be running through. So if you wanna get a chance to actually program a track for yourself, uh, you can do that following the guide in the automation studio help. So Garrett will show us where that is and kind of talk us through it. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Garrett and we'll, we'll get to showing his screen here. All right, thanks, Corey. So what we're looking at right now is not actually Automation Studio. It's a, uh, a program we call Scene Viewer. And what this program does is it takes outputs from our simulation that's running in Automation Studio and uses those to drive 3D models uh, so we can actually visualize what's happening within the simulation that we're, we're programming in in Automation Studio. And so, you know, we're, we're looking at a simple oval running 15 shuttles, just constant velocity around. So this is just a really, really basic application. Uh, but, you know, if I were to take what is running in the simulation and transfer it to actual hardware with the same setup, you would see the exact same behavior with the shuttle. So it's a really cool tool for seeing exactly what would happen on actual hardware. So I'm going to go ahead and get into the Automation Studio project to see how we get that up and running. So I've got a finished configuration that I'm working out of now, but I'm gonna to switch to a blank configuration as if we were opening a new project. Yeah, and just a quick note, Garrett, on, on the simulation that you mentioned, that's like a really, really powerful part of kind of the software side of it. Um, when we look at pretty much any project, it's, it's almost always gonna start in simulation and also uh, live in simulation during development and end in simulation. Well, it ends in, in real hardware, but because it's the same software that's running on an actual track and in simulation, it's a really powerful tool for development, uh, for honing in on the design. Uh, you know, you often get the question, okay, like, well, what's my throughput gonna be? Or how many shuttles do I need? That's where the simulation really comes in handy. Excellent. All right, so now we're gonna get started on the step-by-step -step process. Again, I'm following what's in the Automation Studio Guide. I'm skipping over a couple really small configuration steps to focus on what's really important for the, the track process. Uh, so if you do go through the guide, just make sure you, you look through the steps there. Um, but you know, the first thing we're gonna do is add our uh, track oval configuration in the configuration view. So we're gonna add it to this folder called Map Motion. And you know, maybe what is Map Motion as just a quick starting point. Uh, Map Motion is our group of motion control libraries that take PLC open compliant function blocks and you know typically adds them all together into a single function block that's a lot easier to get up and running uh, for things like a six axis robot or for uh, you know a, a, a single servo axis or something like that. And it's also connected to the rest of the map components like our alarming and our recipe system. And so 
as a really powerful group of, of libraries there. And track is uh, also within that library. So if you're used to programming in you know our, our servo drives and things like that, you'll feel pretty comfortable with track. It's not going to be a lot different. So in this folder, I've got it selected. I'm in my context sensitive toolbox. Now I'm going to add that oval configuration. So I'm going to select map track, mechatronic designs track, and I have this track oval and I'm going to bring it over. And so what is in this package that we just added? We have three files, the assembly file, the shuttle stereotype file, and the sector file. Let's take a look at the assembly file first. So in this file, we have you know, a few things, but the main thing we have here is we have the configuration of the layout of our track. And so we've got it laid out with 16 segments um, and they're in track one. So track is a continuous group of segments. And so we're just basically saying, hey, we've got these 16 segments. We've got them aligned end to end for each of the segments. And uh, we want to have the uh, position being zero from segment one counting right to left. Uh, so we're basically setting up in our um, software space what the track layout is. The next file is our shuttle stereotype. This is basically saying, OK, what kind of measurement units do we want? Um, and what are our max velocities, max excels, B cells? Uh, we can set some of those limits here. And then the last file is uh, what's called a, a sector. And a sector basically is like a coordinate system along the edge of a track. And we can set up as many sectors as we want. Um, and we do this to focus in on areas of the track that we want to control some process around. Here, because we're just doing constant velocity movements around the entire track, we just have one sector set up uh, that goes from the first segment all the way to the last segment. So it encompasses the entire track. But we can have as many of these set up, and they can be as small as the width of one shuttle or as big as the whole track. So we don't have to make any changes to these files. The, the track oval already has them all set up. Uh, we just need to add it to our project. So then the next step that we're going to do is add the actual hardware. So here, what we're really doing is configuring the hardware itself, so the motor segments themselves, especially with like the network layout and how we reference these segments. So I've got my PC. This is running our real-time uh, operating system. I've got a power link hub for very large architectures. We have a star uh, power link network layout that we use. Uh, so we have a, a hub here for power link. And then I've got one segment already in here, but I'm going to add a few more. So to build my layout, I'm just going to be dragging and dropping segments from the toolbox. So I've got some straight segments, and I've got some curved segments and some circular arc segments. And then kind of copy and paste them and add them together. So then to connect these segments to our network, we just drag and drop from the PowerLink connection ports to get them all laid out. And I would just do that around all 16 segments. I'm not going to do it because it takes a second. I've got it already done in the other configuration. The next thing we need to do is configure each segment itself. Uh, so when we open up the configuration, we can have some settings around like stop reaction if we wanted to just coast or do an induction stop on that um, segment based on uh, different stop conditions. But the main thing we want to change here is the segment reference. So we saw some of these segment references in the assembly layout that was saying, OK, which motor segments go where. Here we're assigning the reference to the physical motor segment on the network. So all I need to do is come in and set that reference, and I would do it for each one of the motor segments in the hardware layout. Yeah, so that, that reference that you just put in is, is what ties the hardware layout to your map motion configuration, right? Exactly. And so what I'm doing now is switching back to my finished configuration. Here you can see I've got all 16 segments laid out, connected to each other in PowerLink. And if I were to open up the configuration for each one, just pick one. You can see I've got the segment references for each one laid out. So that's all we needed to do to configure the track system. We're done configuring. We added our track oval. We've added the hardware. Um, you know, a particularly important thing is all of the node numbers are laid out for the hardware. So if we were to have real hardware, we would know our network topology. The last thing we need to do is actually add um, our logical component, our software component, to command the movements and the power on of the track. 
And so if I go to the logical view, I've just clicked it here, down here. Uh, you see I've got two packages for um, tasks or programs that are running on the track. The first one is called start movement under assembly control, and the other one is biz under visualization. Just to touch real quick on what the visualization one is, you're not going to need to do any programming in that. All it's doing is taking the set points and positions of the shuttles around the track, converting that information into a friendly format for scene viewer so that it's outputting over our, our PVI connection uh, to the, the scene viewer visualization tool. So we don't need to do any programming in that. All the programming to control this is done in the start movement task. And so if we open this up, uh, the first thing you'll notice is, okay, this is a text-based language. We usually do our programming in structured text. One of the benefits besides just the readability of the syntax is that it's really easy to set up state machines in the structured text. And we prefer state machines for controlling the, the ACFOS track just because it's a really nice way to have a, a structured software approach and it's, it's really modular. And so, for example, we won't read through every line, but you can see I've got a state for powering off when I want to power off, powering on, adding shuttles. In simulation, we add the shuttles. In real hardware, shuttles are detected when automatically, and we can go through and search them in this get shuttle state. So here we go around the track, and we search for shuttles that have been found. And then we're in a ready state. And here I'm waiting for a command for when I want the track to actually start the movement. And then our movements are all commanded in this process state. So I'm not going to go through all the function blocks we can use to command movements. This is just an example of one is our routed move velocity block. So this routed move velocity block basically tells a shuttle to move at a particular velocity to a particular sector or destination on the track. Here, I'm just looping through all the shuttles, reissuing this routed move velocity command to keep them moving in constant velocity. So while it looks like they're all moving coordinated together, that is just a function of them all being created next to each other. Each one's actually commanded these moves individually and being controlled individually. Right, so, so is this like a standard implementation or? You know, I would say this is a very, very rudimentary implementation. This is just okay. to get our single oval running with a uh, just a constant velocity as the only thing that's happening on the track. Okay. Uh, typically we would get back into what we talked about a little bit earlier, those process points to make decisions on the track and uh, then do more interesting things like divert to other areas. And I think we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So yeah, okay. so this is a really good question. This is just really rudimentary. Let's get our shuttles moving so we can see it in scene viewer. Let's use one function block that commands movement to a shuttle. Gotcha, so really all we're doing is telling each shuttle, all right, start, start moving around the track. Exactly. And so, you know, how do I actually get this going? Well, you know, normally I would do a, a build and a configuration, uh, an offline install to my simulation. I've already got it up and running, so I'm gonna skip that step for time's sake. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is open up a watch window. This lets me interface directly with the uh, variables that are on the PLC. And so if I was connected to real hardware, it would behave exactly the same. And so the first thing I'm gonna do, and let me try and get my screens split here so we can see what's happening in scene viewer at the same time. Just give me one second here to adjust this. And so, you know, before I command anything to power on, first I need to start PVI. This is just the, the variable connection between our simulation and automation studio and the, the scene viewer tool. So just make sure that's running. I can see it's running here in the corner. And then I command a power on. Okay, in my state machine, now I've gone through the assembly power on step. The motors are controlling the, seg uh, the, the motors are controlling the shuttles, and I've gone through a step to create shuttles and simulation on real hardware. They would be found on the track automatically. So the next thing I want to do is start the movements. So now I'm going to go into that process state we looked at and command the moves. And so they're all moving now under routed move velocities. So they're just moving at a constant velocity around the track. And that's it. Now I have my, my first track project up and running with, you know, 15 shuttles moving around in Oval and, you know, not too long. Yeah, so I guess let's let's run back through the steps that, that um, it took to get us here. So there's kind of three different uh, steps if we break it down at kind of a high level and, and one taking place in each one of the views in Automation Studio. So in the configuration view, we added the track Oval package, which had those different... Uh, configuration packages in there to define the 
the different uh, ways that the segments are related to each other. Then we added those okay. in the physical view, right? So we dropped them in, connected them with our little power link connectors and gave each one of them a reference that corresponded to um, the configuration that we set up. So then at that mm -hmm. point, we had kind of the, the basic configuration done uh, for the track. And um, so we had kind of our hardware and the configuration of that hardware defined. And then the last step that, that we looked at was just the software. And so you had put together a state machine um, to power up the track, wait for it to be ready, and then just mm -hmm. issue a command to start those shuttles moving around. And so that's um, kind of what we were looking at just now on your screen is just those shuttles moving around. Did I do a good job? Yep. <laughs> yeah, you got it spot on. And if you missed any of those steps, again, this is step-by-step step taken directly from our Automation Studio Getting Started Guide. Uh, if you haven't used the Getting Started Guide, it's in Automation Studio. They're really great. I recommend them to you know play around with all of our technologies. Uh, but specifically for ACBOSS track, you can find it in the motion control, map motion, guides, getting started, ACBOSS track directory. And so it'll take you through each one of those steps. Uh, for the programming, you know, you don't have to set up your own state machine. You can just copy and paste the variable declarations and the, the tasks directly from the help to get it set up. So really, it's, it's a nice walkthrough. It'll help you avoid any mistakes and uh, definitely take a look. Awesome. Great, so I think one thing that, that I wanted to talk about just a little bit more was the process-oriented programming that we kind of teased out. So what we were showing in the simulation that we were just looking at is basically those 15 shuttles just assigned a velocity to move around the track continuously. Uh -huh. um, so like we mentioned, that's not a very typical application. Usually you wanna do a little, a little more than just uh, fly them around the track at a constant velocity. Um, so that's where um, what we call process-oriented programming comes into play. So Garrett, can you kind of walk us through what process-oriented programming is and how we use it in a track application? Sure. You know, this, to your point, that was a very simple track layout. Uh, we can get much, much more complex layouts and add a lot of power to these applications. And so what you're looking at on the screen now is an example of a, a more interesting layout where we have some diverts for a parallelized process. And uh, what we do with process-oriented programming is we focus on the areas that we're actually either making a decision or doing something on the track. So we have what we call process points. I think we said that earlier. This is where we make our decisions. And so some of these arrows you see, the, the ones that go across the track line itself, that's where when a shuttle goes by, we basically get a trigger of an event that that shuttle has crossed over that area. And then we want to take a look at what's on that shuttle. Maybe it's a different type of product, or maybe it's um, you know some information about the, the travel of the shuttle. We want to make a decision on where it wants to go. So here we've got three processes. Maybe I'm running two products, and I want product one to go to stations one and two, and product two to go to station three. Maybe I want to do some load balancing based on what, how many shuttles I have at each station. I'm going to make a decision on where I want it to go at that point, at the process point, and then command a new routed move to whatever station I want. The diversion that happens to get it there, that happens automatically through the, the track control library that's handling the collision avoidance and the diversion. So we're really only worried about sending it to where we want it to go, and then we forget about it. A good way to think about this is like programming the traffic light and not the traffic. You don't want to have to be worried about tightly controlling every shuttle through uh, a divert or doing collision avoidance on your own. That's all handled. We're really worried about just sending a shuttle where we want to do something to it, and then doing tight control if it's necessary at that area. So here you see a couple different highlighted sections of the track. These go back to what we were talking about with sectors where we can set up basically like a coordinate system in just a small area. And here's where we would do something like, I don't know if it's a routed move or we can do something, just some process that adds value to the shuttle. And then once we're done with that, we can release them to maybe uh, another series thing. So here it looks like an unloading process where we'd unload like a batch of three. We would release them and the, again, the diverts between these two processes would be handled automatically through the track control library. You know, another really cool thing about the process oriented programming is it's decoupled on the programming side from how you actually have the track laid out. So let's say you have a machine with different options, slightly different track layouts, but relatively the same processes you can um, actually deploy the same code to just a slightly different configuration and leverage what you've already done in the development for that, that process-oriented programming. So you can really reuse the same um, 
you know, process over and over again, which is really cool. And then another thing too, is we have all these decision points. Let's say we have a process go down or we need to do some, some maintenance on something, but we want to keep the machine up and running. We can do things like, you know, just say, okay, I don't want to go to the station anymore. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. disabling the station. You can keep the machine up and that has huge implications for things like OEE. Yeah, for sure. So let's take a quick look at, at a simulation of, of a track that's running more of this process oriented style programming. It's not this exact application, but it's, it's something quite similar. So this is again, running in scene viewer. So can you uh, explain to us what, what we're looking at here? Uh huh. So this is, I would say like one step up from what we started with in our uh, rudimentary project where now we have an additional oval situated next to our, our other oval. So we would have to add the configuration for this in our, our configuration view. Uh, but basically what we're doing here is we're randomly assigning colors. We often use colors for the visualization to say something different about a product. Maybe these are different products running on the same line. And what we're doing is we're making the decision where every time a shuttle that is blue comes between the two tracks, we want to divert it off to do a separate process to just the blue shuttles. And it looks like we're doing something like unloading because they go from blue to gray. And so all the green and the yellow shuttles pass undiverted and the blue shuttles are always diverted and then merged back into the product flow. And so the collision avoidance that those diverts and the actual routing through the divert happens automatically once we've made that decision at the process point. Yeah, yeah exactly. So this is, I think, a really good example of, of how you can use process points to program. So you know, the process point is basically what, what colors the shuttle or what product is on the shuttle. So some sort of inspection station perhaps gets that data or maybe we know from, from our uh, ERP system or something. And then we can tell at that process point, okay, this shuttle needs to be diverted to be offloaded because it's blue um, or because it's this product or that product. And the green and yellow ones just pass through that, that divert. And yeah, I think the other really powerful thing that, that this shows is, is how the diverts are handled, which is part of mm -hmm. the firmware. So we're, we're just telling where, where we want to go. We're telling the shuttle where to go. And the, the firmware of the track is, is helping to avoid those collisions. Um, and helping to make sure that there's, you know, seamless um, transitions in and out of the diverts as well. Yeah, and, and maybe one more thing to add on like how we actually track which shuttle has what. You know, each mm -hmm. shuttle in the, the control system has a certain amount of configurable data that moves along with it. So when we get to these process mm -hmm. points, we can take a look at that data. So when you put, you know, product A on a shuttle, then you can say to that shuttle basically, okay, you have a product A. And when we get mm -hmm. to another point on the track, and we look at a shuttle and we say, okay, hello shuttle, what kind of product do you have, right? We say, okay, product A, okay, I want you to divert or I want you not to divert. So it, it's really, you know, a kind of a, a, a set it and forget it from a, a data standpoint. So your software doesn't need to grow into some kind of crazy organizational thing where you're tracking everything through large arrays. You know, it's already built in on the shuttles to do that right. for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a really good point. So that's, that's our quick intro to um, Automation Studio for ActPostTrack. Like we've mentioned a couple times already, you can find this in the Automation Studio Help, so we definitely recommend you you uh, give that a look if it's something that's interesting to you. Um, you know, I think my, my biggest takeaway from the discussion today is how powerful simulation is. You know, it's it was really nice to be able to actually show that, that software up and running um, for everybody watching just by using our simulation. Um, so we didn't have to set up a, a webcam to look at an actual track. We can just show that in simulation. And I think um, Garrett did a really good job of showing ju just how, how easy that is to, to get up and running. You know, those um, you know, 3D files and such are automatically generated when you build the project. And from there, it's just connecting the variables um, through the PVI connection. Um, so yeah, that scene viewer tool combined with Automation Studio is, is I think really, really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head. And for me, I think the biggest takeaway with just this technology in general is, you know, individual control of the shuttles, this ability to simulate, it's really changing the way we think about a lot of different processes. And so from a software side, having, you know, the ability to, without a huge time investment, have a playground to develop and generate these ideas on how your process might look completely different and have huge value for your customer um, is, is really neat to be able to do that in such a, a streamlined development. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, thank you, Garrett. I appreciate you taking some time to walk us through. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. Absolutely, thanks for having me. All right, good. So before we sign off, I just wanted to tease out the next couple 
episodes that we have coming up. Um, I mentioned it at, at the top of the uh, episode, but tomorrow actually we have database for industrial machines. Make sure you set up notifications for that one so you get a, a, a little ping on your cell phone uh, when we go live with that. And then um, right after that one, the following week, Tuesday, um, April 14th, we're gonna be talking through organization and automation studio. So those are gonna be some fun conversations. Make sure you um, set the notification for those and then you'll, you'll get a nice, uh, like I said, little ping on your cell phone friendly reminder that, that we've gone live and you can hop in and join us and ask questions. Um, on that note, please subscribe. Uh, if you haven't already, that is uh, very helpful for us. Uh, helps us know that hopefully we're doing something right. If you have any comments, uh, questions, or want to make a suggestion, feel free to leave those in the comment box below. Um, there will also be contact information in the description below. Uh, so feel free to reach out on any of the platforms listed there. And we will see you next time on This Is Automation Live. Thanks again for joining.